This is It Was a Thing on TV. Born a red man has ever done something like this to me. It's a killer. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the dregs of humanity. Episode 154, Submission 1651, SOS Titanic. SOS Titanic was a made for that aired on ABC the night of September 23rd, 1979. That's as much as we can do without being sued. And I like how Zoom said, are you playing music? Oh, it did? It did. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I would be lucky if my zoo did that. So this day in history, April 15th, 1912, in the icy waters of the North Atlantic, the RMS Titanic, the crown jewel of the White Star Line, ran into an iceberg and stuck its whole ass up in the air. Yep. Right before it broke into three separate pieces... And fell to the bottom of the Atlantic, where it rests to... No, it was three. It was two. It was three. Oh, I didn't realize it was three. Oh, yeah, it was three. I thought it was just the... the it broke in two, or did another piece break off when it was descending in the ocean? Yes. Okay. But yes. Uh, the Titanic ran into an iceberg, dit, 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 like little divorce code, and it was built to withstand... Four bulkheads being blooded. The bitch took out five. A big ass gash. And it's like, this boat's sinking. Let's get the hell off this boat. Eh, no, it's not sinking. It'll be fine. It's clear. I swear. You steerage folk are all crazy. But, of course, there have been many movies about the Titanic over the years. And one Broadway musical. One Broadway musical, a Tony Ward winning Broadway musical, but arguably, I think two of the most famous movies about the Titanic were 1958's A Night to Remember, and of course, the James Cameron directed version of Titanic from 1997. Which had the record for the largest gross for a movie until a couple of movies in the 2000s came along. Like, I don't know. Well, James Cameron broke it. Avatar. Yeah, James Cameron broke it with Avatar. Then the Avengers Endgame, then Avenger- back to Avatar. Yeah. Well, in between, though, in between A Night to Remember and the 1997 Titanic, we had this movie. SOS Titanic, which was released theatrically in Britain by EMI Films. But in America, it aired on ABC, baby. And then... She's sinking. They said she'd last forever. She's never been seen since. SOS Titanic. Sunday. That star-studded ABC season of 1979. Yeah. And not only that, but considering ABC was known for airing long-ass versions of movies, this version of SOS Titanic that aired on ABC aired a good... 40 minutes longer than the theatrical cut. Yep. And not only that, it has an alternate opening. It had an alternate opening that you will only see in the TV release, which was never aired in syndication in many markets where people still aired movies in syndication. So we have the wireless operator, Harold Cottom, played by... Christopher Strolley, who actually was originally supposed to be the male lead in this movie, but considering the actress who was cast as the love interest of the male lead was significantly older than him, he as a make good played the wireless operator of the Carpathia, which, as we know, was the ship that rescued the survivors of the Titanic. And it was the first ship we saw in the movie. Yes, in the TV cut of the movie. So... Mm-hmm. He goes to the captain, and he says, the Titanic, it's sinking. And the captain's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm positive. Captain, 
Captain, sir, sir, wake up. Come away, come away. Captain, you're just dropping off. Who is it? First officer Dean, sir. Bloody hell, Dean. Since when you push your way in here without knocking? Sorry, sir, it's an emergency. I don't care a blue damn what it is. I want to see some discipline on this ship. Yes, sir, I'm sorry, sir. Who's up with you? It's Cotton, sir. Cotton? Wireless operator, sir. Ah, oh, yes. He's had an urgent communication from the Titanic. The Titanic? Well, what is it? It's the CQD, sir. CQ? Are you sure? Yes, sir. They used the new distress signal as well, SOS. She struck an iceberg. She's uh, 58 miles away. Our course is north, 52 west. Now get back to your men on the Titanic. Tell them we're coming as fast as we can, that we should be there in uh, just in four hours' time. Four hours? You get through all right? Yes, sir. I told him within four hours, just like you said. And what was his reply? He said, please hurry, old man. Engine room flooded. We're sinking head down. Then there was nothing. So they get there. They get to the ice field. And then they see lifeboats. And then they get all the people that are in the lifeboats. We see some of the characters we're going to see in the movie. And so oh, Susan St. James in a life vest. Oh, man. <clears throat> well, she looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks really good. Looks good. Oh, it looks 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 good. You know what she said as soon as she put on the life vest? Don't say it. Do not say it. Uh oh. <laughs> God damn it, he said it. Yeah, but yeah, we meet all of our main characters, and also, okay, one surprise survivor they find among the group of survivors is J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line. And we all know that story. He did not want to go down with his ship. No, he didn't. But playing J. Bruce Ismay is... I would say one of the absolute legends of British cinema, Ian Holm. Yeah, and it's through his eyes that we see this story. Yeah, because he's seeing in the distance. Because someone on the car pavy, he they find him like out in the distance, and he's like, "I see something," and it's like, "Those are all just chairs." Yep. Well, yeah, just chairs which is all that remains of the largest ship in the world. Mr. Ismay, sir, I'm Dr. McGee, ship surgeon. Won't you come inside now, sir, when it's warm, and we can try to make you comfortable. Comfortable? What's the good of standing out here in the cold this way, sir? Look, look. There's something in the water, just there. I don't see anything, sir. Look, look, it's just there. You use your eyes, why don't you? It's only a bit of flotsam, sir. You sure? A few deck chairs by the look of it. That's all. All I can see, sir. A few chairs. All that beauty. All that strength, power, grace. (laughs) Few chairs. So much gaiety. So now God himself couldn't sink. Yeah. So now we go into the beginning of the story proper as we see. J. Bruce Ismay showing some people around the ship, and he runs into John Jacob Astro and his wife. And of course, uh, they're played by David Jansen. And David Jansen, of course, being the fugitive. Dr. Dr. Richard Kimball, people! And Beverly Ross, I have no idea who she is. She was not in much. I looked at her IMDb, and nope, 
This is probably like her only major thing she did. So they're talking to each other. They're marveling at this incredible feat of engineering. With, by the way, a very, very small rudder. And they're not the only ones talking. Because, like I said in the pre-production, this is a movie of three different stories. The first one, of course, being the historical figures of the White Star Line. And then there's another story between a couple of second-class passengers, namely Lawrence Beasley and Lee Goodwin. Yes. Now, Lawrence Beasley is a real survivor from the Titanic. He was a noted school teacher. And if I'm not mistaken, if I go to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia, a fun fact about him, he is the grandfather of New York Times science editor Nicholas Wade. Yeah, that's something for you. That's something for the old trivia banks. Yes. But okay, playing Lawrence Beasley. Now this is another legend. Oh yeah, David Warner. And if you don't know who David Warner is, just... just Why? don't, Don't. Why? Okay, couple of fun facts. Again, David Warner. Children of the 90s would know him as the British professor on the second Ninja Turtles movie. Oh yes. Or in a later role as Billy Zane's compare in the 1997 Titanic movie. He's the only actor who's in this SOS Titanic and in the Cameron version of Titanic. Mm-hmm. And also, <laughs> if you if you wasn't a big finish, he's in the Doctor Who series of audio plays over the years, and he's actually played an alternate version of the Doctor in the Doctor Who Unbound series from the early 2000s. Wow. Yeah, so if if you want to listen to that, go listen to that. It's very good. It is. And the third story. The third story was more of a cautionary tale because this is how the the movie began in the TV cut where somebody was running up to the Carpathian's captain with a CQD and a new distress call where this movie gets its title, S.O.S., SOS Titanic, which stands for Save Our Ship. And it sort of kind of bookends, because at the end of the film, you see this whole epilogue about how, if it weren't for this maritime disaster, we would not have all of the safety checks that you would have if you were to, say, go on a cruise ship and have a cruise vacation. Which, by the way, I'm going to do as soon as all of this is over. By this is over, you mean the current madness we live in now. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to be sure, yeah. But, I'll say this. You have, throughout the whole course of this movie, you have all these premonitions about the ice field and everything, about how everyone's ignoring it. There's and, a lot of B-roll on the ice. Yeah, they and clearly day for night. You can clearly tell it's like they shot in the day and they put a filter to make it seem like it's nighttime. But Lawrence Beasley says during the scene to his female love interest, you know what? I've heard stuff about maritime disasters and I don't know. I don't think this ship is safe at all. Is it the custom to have some sort of lifeboat drill on Sunday? Yes, that's right. Will there be one today? I haven't heard of it. But isn't it rather important? I mean, that everyone should know just which boat is assigned to where it is and so on? Well, normally I'd say yes, very important. But when you're talking about the Titanic, well, she's one great huge lifeboat herself, ain't she? Put me in my place. Why would you think of lifeboats on a beautiful day like this? I suppose one can't help speculating on the hazards as one puts out to sea. At my hotel in Southampton the day we sailed, I was amazed at the conversations I overheard about famous marine disasters. Everybody speculating how safe the Titanic really is. That's not creepy. Yeah. Oh, hold on a second. We didn't talk about who plays the female love Oh, yeah, we didn't talk interest. about the cast, did we? Well, we did have talked about some of the cast, but, but let's... not all of the cast. Not all of the cast. But let's get to di- who plays David Warner's love interest in the movie. Lee Goodwin, the fictional Lee Goodwin. Yes. Who Playing is her. Amer- who is an American school teacher. Yes, in contrast to David Warner, who's British. Yes. Okay, 
ladies and gentlemen. This is the second time in four weeks we brought her up on the podcast. Mike, are you ready for this? I'm seated, yes. Susan St. James. Oh, no. McMillan's wife. McMillan's wife. She was either Kate or Allie. Yeah. I don't know. I get her confused with Jane Curtin. She's either Kate or Allie. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the gritty reboot of that, by the way. Oh, yeah. That'd be awesome. Unfortunately, they can't. Well, they could use the Ed Sullivan Theater, considering Colbert's not using it these days. True. It could happen. I'm, I'm not banking on it. And going into the rest of the cast... Playing the unsinkable Molly Brown. Chico, do you want to have the honors? Floris Money Flippin Leachman. And I believe this is the second time we've talked about Chorus Leachman because she was on the Nut House. Oh, yes. We miss you, Chloris. Yeah, we do. I'm surprised this isn't only the second time we've talked about her. Well, it is, unfortunately. But you can never get enough Chorus Leachman on this podcast. You never can. She's our D triples. Yeah. Hey, watch that. <laughs> okay. We have playing Thomas Andrews, who is the ship builder of the Titanic. Jeffrey Whitehead, who is a British, practically that guy from that thing. Yep. A British, that guy from that thing. Yeah. More recently, he was in the TV show Not Going Out, where he played the role of Jeffrey. Oh, wow. A guy named Jeffrey playing the role of Jeffrey. That's not uh, original. Hey, Mike, it's like you said. It's like Tony Danza playing Tony. He, he He's like the British Tony Danza. You got that right. We assume. But okay. You know how four episodes ago we said... Out of everybody, Jennifer Lawrence was the most famous person on this podcast. No longer. It's over. It's over. This woman has replaced her as the most famous person we've ever talked about on this podcast. Playing stewardess May Sloan. Helen Mirren. And there was just like one scene. One scene Helen Mirren was in. Maybe in the version you watch, but she's in a couple of scenes here or there. Because she plays, I believe, the stewardess to John Jacob Astor in the movie. Yes. You got some high billing uh, on the version I watched. Yeah. So she also has the coveted and billing. And Helen Mirren. And funny thing, Helen Mirren in 1979 was in the movie Caligula with Malcolm McDowell. And another funny thing is... Another movie Malcolm McDowell was in was Time After Time in 1979. And who played Jack the Ripper in Time After Time? David Warner. Ah. Yes. A classic Time After Time. And if you want to know a funny story about Time After Time, listen to Malcolm McDowell's appearance on Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Oh, playing... Daniel Morvin, who's like a director, because he's got like a camera and such with him during the movie, is actually someone we're going to probably be talking about in at least two episodes on this podcast. Jerry Hauser from The Brady Brides. Famed voiceover actor Jerry Hauser? Yes. And the other one we're going to be talking about, because he was a guest spot in the premiere episode of it. Mike, are you ready for this? Lay it on me. The McLean Stevenson Show. Oh, jeez. Yeah. The McLean Stevenson reference this episode. Also in this movie, playing the role of, I'm not making this character's name up, Chief Boots S. Stebbing is David Batley. And you're probably wondering, who is David Batley? Who's David Batley? Well, Chico, would you believe... He played Charlie Bucket's teacher in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Charlie Bucket, how many did you open? Two. That's easy. Two hundred is twice one hundred. Not two hundred. Just two. Two? What do you mean you only opened two? I don't care very much for chocolate. Well, I can't figure out just two, so let's pretend you opened two hundred. Now, if you opened 200 Wonka bars, apart from being dreadfully sick, you'd have used up 20% of 1,000, which is 15% half over again, 10%. Oh, my gosh. 
Yes, he is in SOS Titanic. And guys, remember when I said that there'd be another person in the Married for Life episode from Willy Wonka that we'd talk about in this podcast? Guess what? He wasn't the person I was talking about. So there's a third person. But you'll have to wait to find that out. One other cast member I want to mention playing an Irish traveler in steerage is Robert Pugh, who plays the character of James Farrell. Now, Robert Pugh is best known today in 2021 for being on Game of Thrones, where he plays the role of Craster. And he was actually in two episodes of Doctor Who from 2010, The Hungry Earth and Cold Blood, where he played the role of Tony Mack. So let's get into the main beats of the story. So our first plot is obviously everybody just it, enjoying their own opulence, as it were. Oh, yeah, they're just like in this incredible ship. You have, like, all the third-class passengers from Ireland. They're all like, oh, my God, we love this ship. Oh, my God, it's so massive. Oh, my God. Yeah, interesting thing. It was Lee Goodwin who briefly, and this is sort of a cross-pollination between plots, Lee Goodwin tells Lawrence Beasley to pursue a person in steerage, but he doesn't want to because ultimately his eyes is going to be on her. Yeah, because she's a teacher like him. Yeah. And they both love books. Yeah, they go to the library a lot in this movie. They do. They do a lot of thinking. A lot of communal thinking. That's a a thought, right? Yeah. It is now. Communal thinking, of course. Meanwhile, while... Sorry, Mike. What what was it you said? I, I said, how about communal thinking? Yeah. I think that's the word you're looking for. Yeah, that's it communal thinking so you have these two who are basically acting as observers to both the upper class in their sort of denial of what's about to happen spoiler alert and the steerage folk who are trying to escape what's going to happen double spoiler alert and again while they're on the ship they're both having sort of their uh, own ideas of the time of their lives. Oh, yeah. This is about as good as it's ever going to get for them Mm -hmm. on this ship. And meanwhile, on the night of April 15th, or the morning of April 15th, night of April 14th, 1912, well, there is a dramatic scene with uh, very cheap special effects, I should say. A dramatic scene where an iceberg approaches... Titanic closes in, and the only thing you hear somebody say is, well, play the clip. Christ. What did you see? Iceberg, right ahead. Thank you. Iceberg, right ahead. On the starboard. Yeah, they hit it all right. Yep. Captain Smith talks to Thomas Andrews about the damage that's been done to the ship. And, well, we'll let Thomas Andrews explain it here. Is it hopeless, then? It appears that the unthinkable has happened. As you know, the ship is designed to stay afloat with any three of its first five compartments flooded. It would even float if all five were gone, torn away completely, but... Under no circumstances can she be expected to remain afloat with those five compartments flooded. The sheer weight of the flooding must inevitably bring her down at the head. Every sort of potential damage was considered in the planning. 
But who could have anticipated a collision that would leave a gash close to 300 feet long in a side? The pumps will help, of course. Temporarily. How much time do you give us? At a rough guess, one hour, possibly two. Gentlemen, I must say something to you now, which you can well appreciate is the nightmare of every master, and which in 32 years of service to this company, I never expected to have to say. We must prepare for abandon ship. Yeah, so they're pretty much screwed. One hour, maybe two. One hour, maybe two. Yeah, and you don't have enough lifeboats, so half yeah. the people on board this ship are going to die. They're going to die. They're going to die! It's like a real-life Royal Rumble before the Royal Rumble was invented. Every man for him, every Well, every man, woman, and child for himself, for themselves in this case. So, basically, what the staff is trying to do before everybody, you know, dies is get whoever is in the vicinity to come quickly. Get into these lifeboats. Let's just get out of here. Let's get out of this ship that's sinking. And some people are in, like, in complete denial that the ship is sinking. There's, like, the one scene where there's, like, the four people that are playing that poker game. Yep. They're just, like, playing the poker game. It's like, they don't care. They don't care that the ship is sinking. They just want to get on with their poker game. And, of course, it isn't until the porter knocks on everybody's doors and says, All passengers on deck with the life the on that everybody starts to sort of get the picture. Oh, my God. And then the maid in steerage was like, you have nothing to worry about. Just go back to bed like, lady, do you even know what's going on right now? Yeah, this ship is sinking. This ship is sinking. This is the largest man-made object in the planet, and it's sinking. It's made of iron. It's made of it's iron. It's going to sink. It's going to sink. By the way, there's that one scene in the movie where there's the, the third class passengers. They're throwing the ice from that uh, hit the ice. They're like event. snowballs. They're like snowball fighting on the ship. Mike, if a ship hit an iceberg, the last thing you'd want to do is try have a snowball fight, right? That actually sounds kind of fun. Oh, come on. I know I'm not helping, but... No, you're not. <laughs> no. Meanwhile, in second class, people are wondering, A, how is it that life vests work? And B, why are people playing in the gym? I don't know. It must be a fancy gym. It is a fancy gym. Yeah. At least by 1912 standards. Yeah. And again, more cheap special effects. Here comes the flares. Flares. She. And the wireless operators are frantically trying to get somebody to find them, anybody. Hey, let's save ourselves. Please, get here. I'm miming a teletype from, like, 1912, the wireless. And these jokers are still playing poker, or whatever it is they're playing. I'm pretty sure it's not poker. Maybe it's bridge. I don't know. You know the one thing I notice is that everybody seems very calm about it. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Uh, ship this sinking. ship's sinking. We're probably all going to die. Whatever. Put your life vests on and shut up. But not Molly Brown. No, because Chorus Leachman don't take no from anybody. Nope. Yeah, she wants to know what's going on and where's everybody going. And why is there a band playing? Yeah. A oh, moving band's playing. A moving band that's playing. Now you know you're in first class, by the way. Yeah. Actually, one principal difference of this film with other film versions, rather than the sacred Nearer My God to Thee, which the ship's band plays, they just use secular ragtime tunes. Which, why? Again, I, maybe, they were, might, maybe they wanted to make it the, Maybe they wanted to make it the happy version of the Titanic sinking. Mm, I didn't oh. know there was a not happy version of the Titanic sinking. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. The happy version of the Titanic is clearly that animated movie with the rapping dog. You know there's something you should know, so I'm gonna tell you so. Don't sweat it. Forget it. Enjoy the show. Working all day, now it's time to unwind. Kick back, relax, take a load off your mind. <laughs> I'll be busting the moves. 
rhymes and I'll be busting the rhymes. We'll be busting up laughing cause it's party time. Everybody's feeling fine cause it's party time. Party time, it's party time. Everybody's feeling fine cause it's party time. Party time, it's party time. Yeah. Everybody's feeling fine cause it's party time. Party time, it's party time. Make it stop. Man, if only Sam Beckett were here to save everybody on the Titanic. Yeah, the Quantum Leap Accelerator doesn't go that far back. We've established this. Oh, yeah, because he can only go back to when he was born. Yeah. What? Unless he had a relative that was on the Titanic. That's another story. But then what else happens? Everybody's loading the lifeboats, and Molly's like, what are you girls doing? Everybody get in the boats. Everybody get in the boats. I'm Cloris Leachman. And then the guy forces her into the boats, and, well, obviously we know the uh, story of the unsinkable Molly Brown, because made even more unsinkable by Chloris freaking Leachman. Damn straight. Ship is sinking, and it's just like, ugh. It's, oh, oh, there's also a scene where the third-class passengers are trying to get through in the first-class dining room. Of course they are. And they're trying to get through the first class dining room, but one of the people that's guarding is like, "Oh, you can't get past the dining room because you you don't belong here. You're third class." But they're like, "Well, at least let the women go through." And then the person guarding the room's like, "Yeah, you're right." And he just Brit- lets the women Brit- go. Through. British chivalry demands. British chivalry demands it, and there's like, "Okay." Okay, you ladies, you can go on through. Meanwhile, we have perhaps some of the best stunt work in the film, where all of the men are trying to jump into the lifeboats. Jump, 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 jump! Including what looks to be one Jay Bruce as May. Oh, yeah. He gets into the lifeboat. And Captain Smith just looks at, at Bruce as May like, You son of a bitch. Yes. And the security are loading up their guns. Because apparently that was a thing in 1912. Well, if anyone tried to get on the boat, if they weren't supposed to be on it, someone had to give some order. Yep. Some proper British order. Yeah. Meanwhile, as the Titanic continues to sink, we have everybody is still being very laissez-faire about it. I didn't know it was a party! We have one of the Stauses just getting really angry as to why he's not in one of the boats and why the boats are getting lowered prematurely. And he does the whole, do you know who I am sort of thing? Yeah, I own Macy's. I own Macy's, damn it. And it turns out he just crumbles. Yeah. Well, at least him and his wife, they're going to die together on the boat. Oh, yeah. But not Susan St. James, because she gets on the boat. Oh, she gets on the lifeboat, yeah. They're stuck because, on the but you knew, But you knew she was going to get on the lifeboat, because... We saw her in the beginning of the of the TV version. Yes. We saw her getting off the boat. Meanwhile, in steerage, we have a bunch of crying children. Yeah. Uh... This is not a good look. No. Well, it got real, folks. Yep, like, men stay back, women and children, everybody, women and children up on deck. But it was clear that they were screwed. Yeah. It's like they were being led up to deck. There's no one on deck. What's there to do but play snowballs with the ice? Except the guys were like, no, nah, no, nah, man, screw that mess. We're going up on deck. We're going to get into those lifeboats. We're going to get into those boats. But as it would happen, everybody was locked in. Oh. But apparently, because it's a TV production, it doesn't stand a chance against the weight of a very heavy Irishman. They take time out from their dying to admire just how grandiose the uh, dining room is. Yeah, that's the scene I talked about earlier. Yeah. So let's get back to uh, the Astors trying to... Wait, uh, wait, wait. We're, we're, we're dying. We need to, to enjoy the spectacle that's known as the dining room. Yes. Well, they're poor. They Remember, have... they're poor. they poor. These Irish people that are in third class are poor. They'd have never seen a dining room this fancy before. 
They have a Titanic cake. Yeah, remember, one of the girls on this boat going on the Titanic has never had dinner in her life. She actually said that. It's an abandoned ship for a run for your life, but what is it at all? It's lunch. Do you make that racket every time it's lunch then? And breakfast and dinner. Third class dining saloon once again, thank you. Dinner. They call tea dinner. What swank. I never had dinner in my life. We're on our way to ruin the bunch of us. Because apparently, I guess in Britain, I guess dinner is tea, right? Oh, we're going to get letters from British people. I should have someone, at least from the UK, explain what the difference is between tea and dinner. Okay, so place to be nation's Kel and McDougal explain to me that in northern England, they will call their dinner tea, whereas in southern England, they will call it dinner. However, in Scotland, it is not uncommon to hear people call their lunch, quote-unquote, dinner, and their dinner, quote-unquote, tea. But for the most part, it's just a different way of saying the same thing, referring to their evening meal. Thank you, Callum. Also, you get it if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings. And that little kid has to leave his toy behind, which one of the staffers just steps on. Like, yeah. it's no big deal. Like, it's nothing. Like, you want to leave this toy? Well, screw you. I'm just going to step on it. We're all dying. Who cares? And then there's another day for night shot. So much day for night in this movie. And then we get to the third plot, which was the telegraph room. Yeah. Yeah. Not many people know that this was probably the uh, sort of bookend of the movie. The reason why we're making this movie in the first place was to talk about the messages. So while the messages are going out, the men of third class are pretty much storming the grand foyer, and anybody who's still in third class right now is about to drown. And the band's just playing as everybody's rushing up for a lifeboat or a life jacket, a wooden door or something. Could you imagine the band playing and that rapping dog with that boombox comes? Oh, God. Stop it. And by the way, we see that everybody's just going diagonal. There's no real pitch or roll to it because this was made in 1979 and we didn't know all we knew about the uh, Titanic sinking that we do now. Yeah, because in this version like, of the... There's no list. If you look at the film, there's no list being portrayed. Yeah, and also, the ship doesn't break apart. It wasn't common knowledge to everybody that the ship broke apart while it was sinking. It sank as one piece. And of course, one of the people looking out from the lifeboats is Lord Beasley, because yeah. we all know he survives. Yeah, as we saw in the beginning of the movie. So Lords Beasley and Lee Goodwin both survive. Yeah. Do they find each other on the Carpathia? Yeah, they do find each other on the Carpathia. It's okay. Like... The moment. Okay. Let's... There's Titanic, big ass in the air. Now, if this was 1997, we'd see the power flicker and the ship split into two. Yeah. And you'd see Leo and Kate, they'd be hanging on to, like, the top of the bow. As yeah. it was sinking. But no, not in this version. Nope. Whole thing goes under. Whole thing goes under. Nose dives even. Nose dives even. So you can tell that this movie was pretty much dated. There's no breakage into two or three, depending on what time this was airing in. And there's no list. Because there's also a notable list. Oh, yeah, because they had to take names, right? No, I, when I say list, I mean... The ship was leaning to one side. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about the scene in, near the end of the Titanic movie when, when they're trying to get all the names in the 97 movie. And then it's gone. It's gone. Everybody's commiserating. Well, people who are crying in their boats are swimming for something. And everybody was like, we could take more out of the water. We took everybody we could. Yeah, Let's see. Well. What's the use of any more dying? What's of no use to anyone? There's nothing more we can do for them. We took all we could out of the water. We'll get swamped if we go back. What's the use in any more dying? That's no help to anyone. And there's the doll! Oh my god! Now I'm sad. 
Oh. Quick cut to the next day where we are back on the Carpathia. Yeah, Jay Bruce is man. He's like, he's just all commiserating. Yeah. And then we have like Lawrence Beasley and Lee Goodwin reunited on the Carpathia. Obviously, they're not going to end up together. Otherwise, we would have heard about it. Yeah. And besides, Susan St. James' character is fictional anyway, so. Yeah. But everybody was looking at Jay Bruce Ismay. Like, you mother. Like, you son of a bitch. Mike, if you saw Jay Bruce Ismay, what would you think? I'd be like, hey, Jay Bruce, you were a pretty good player for the Cincinnati Reds back in the day. Oh, wrong Jay Bruce. I'm sorry. Bet you never thought you'd hear a Jay Bruce reference on this podcast. (laughs) Hey, expect the unexpected around here. That's what we do. Meanwhile, Lee and Lawrence, they're back together. And they notice that nobody's screaming or sobbing. It was very much quiet. Yeah. It hasn't hit them, but don't worry, it will. Well, we get into the last scene of the movie where Mrs. Astor is with a bunch of people that just lost their husbands, too. And we'll we'll just play the clip right here. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies. I'm Mrs. Arkin from New York. I'm just one of the passengers on the Carpathia trying to do my bit. I got hot coffee here and sandwiches, huh? Oh, now, come on. You've got to have some nourishment after all. Come on, dear, you set them an example. Please don't do that. Just give it to somebody else, won't you, please? Every one of these ladies has just lost her husband. I know that, son. I know how I'd feel in their place. And believe me, my heart goes out to you, all of you. But you've got to go on living. You just have to say to yourself it was God's will. Whatever you do, you must never lose faith in the infinite wisdom and mercy of the Lord. Coffee. Hmm? No coffee. No God, either. God went down with the Titanic. Like I said, there was an epilogue here, and I will uh, queue up the epilogue and read it to you. Okay. The Titanic sank with 2,220 passengers and crew, 1,517 perished, 703 survived. And this is all part of the credits, by the way. Oh, yeah. This is a great part about the credits. They have the people that died first. In Uh alphabetical order. And then they have the people that were saved at the bottom. That is fantastic. Yeah. No, no, wait. That son of a bitch. (laughs) Okay, now, if you want to cut this, you can. I got to ask. You you had the survivors uh, at the bottom, and you had the the people who perished on top? Yeah. Shouldn't it be the other way around? The, The people who didn't survive should be at the bottom? Sort of like real life, T. He. I'm sorry. Oh gosh. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm going to my room. You go to your room and think about what you've done, Mike. Yeah, I, Mike. I, I, I need to go to my new bedroom and and think about for a hard, long, hard time. Yes, yes, you do. Yeah. Well, I was remembering that there was a more extensive sort of crawl in the theatrical yeah. cut that was syndicated all over the world. Yeah. Explaining how this tragedy gave rise to many of the maritime safety measures that are actually on ships nowadays. Yeah, because as we mentioned, this was released theatrically in England. But we didn't get this here theatrically, obviously, because they aired it as a TV movie here. Yeah, all of that sort of thing is best illustrated in the beginning of the film, which if you have a chance to get it on DVD, please do so. Yes, because last year, actually last October, they released this on a special edition DVD and Blu-ray from Kino Warber, which has the theatrical edition. But for the first time commercially available, they released the TV cut of the movie which is why we decided to put this on this podcast 
on April. Okay. But, Chico, you talked about how this would air in syndication at many points over the years. Yes, it would. That's the first one I saw growing up. Yes, the theatrical cut. Well, so one station in Wichita, Kansas, KSAS, Fox 24, the Fox affiliate in Wichita, Kansas, actually made a hilarious promo promoting this movie in the noon time slot on Sunday, one afternoon. Tell me you're going to play it. Tell me you're going to play it. Well, we're going to play it right here. Before there was the mega money-making motion picture blockbuster Titanic, there was S.O.S. Titanic. The same disaster, minus the cool special effects. The same ship, without the million-dollar designs. So much for the smoking room and the palm court. And the same characters. Sorry, ladies. No Leonardo. But hey, there's this guy. <laughs> Watch S.O.S. Titanic, Sunday, noon on Fox 24. S.O.S. Titanic. Titanic, S.O.S. Titanic. There's really no big difference. I, I mean, the ship still sinks. There you go. <laughs> ah, ah. Oh my gosh, that was great. No difference. The ship still sinks. Brings a tear to your eye. It does, doesn't it? That was glorious. That was well, just ah, yeah. Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss, baby. You got that right. One more thing I want to note is actually, if you want to get the soundtrack to this movie. It is actually available on iTunes. If you search SOS Titanic original film soundtrack, you'll find the soundtrack by the composer Howard Blake, and you'll get at least 30 tracks on there. So you can download that, and I presume you can also download the album off of Amazon Music as well as iTunes. And looking it over, you can get the SOS Titanic album to buy on Amazon Music. It is available for $9.49. And you could also stream it if you have a subscription to Amazon Music Unlimited. Well, guys, what can we say about SOS Titanic? Before it was a thing at the movies in Europe, which became a thing in syndication. In 1979, it was a thing on TV. But guys, we're not done. No. Oh, no, we're not. We're not? No. Guys, it's time to play eBay Price is Right. Damn you! Oh, no. What did he find? I don't want to... You know, uh, I'm going to find out anyway. I want He's Haiku like... Corner back. <laughs> well, we're going to do Haiku Corner at the end, but before we do that... Okay, guys, you are bidding on a Titanic model, and now this is one two hundredth scale of the RMS Titanic Revel Minicraft Pro Built, and let me read this description. A one twenty scale RMS Titanic Pro model Built. This model is over 50 inches long and is nothing short of breathtaking. Museum quality, hands down. This particular model was built for another client, so if you're interested in having one for yourself, contact me. This model can also be seen on Craigslist Seattle. No low bowlers. This model is worth every penny of the asking. If you want cheap, there is plenty of imported stuff on eBay here, and this would be better for you. Thank you for looking. Wow, just hit me in the gut, why don't you? And I'm going to send you the model in the Facebook chat of the picture. That's pretty decent looking. Yeah. That's a 1 in 20, so you could use that for, I don't know, a uh, a school production of Titanic, but not a theatrical. No, maybe a student film. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. We could have that sitting in my school. That would be a nice little introduction piece. Maybe not as to you know, how to build a ship. Maybe you know, less like, than, you know, how like to tit- build a ship. Yeah, yeah I, could, I could see it right now. Titanic. The world's greatest maritime disaster. Until the folks at Costa screwed up with the Concordia. Oh, yeah. For more about that, visit Jake Williams Abandoned about that. But okay. This is the buy it now price on the item. So okay. we're going to start the bidding with Chico. I'm going to bid $75. $75, Mike. No real reason. Just throwing okay. a number out there. Chico, I think the world of you, 
that is not a $75 piece. I'm not going to just do 7501. I'm not going to do 76, but I legitimately think that given all the detail and, and the, the craftsmanship and the materials used, I'm going to give you a wide berth here. I'm going to say $199. Guys. Don't do say you, we overbid. Do you want to know the price of this? Are you ready for this? Oh, it's more than 199. I was going to go to like it 500. Is gonna... What is it? Mike, do you want? All right. Okay. It's okay. So, so let's, okay. Okay. Let's get this out of the way. I won. You won. Uh, but we're now okay. we're, 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 we're now actually, over 500. So take a guess. Take a guess. At over, it's over 500. 750. Now Mike's bidding. Okay. Now it's four and a half feet long. And again, with that detail, I would say it's probably about $1,200. Here it is. Are you ready for the price? $3,000. Shut up. And do you want to know how much it is to ship this? Oh, it's got to be at least probably about $300. It is $300. Oh. You oh got it God. on the nose, Mike. Oh, this my. is $3,300. Shut up. I mean, it's beautiful, but I mean, you really need it to be. It is so time, beautiful. You really need to be a big time Titanic fan to, to excuse the phrase that this is not. Uh, intended you need to be a real big titanic fan to sink that much money into that yeah you know what you could sink your time into though our website it was a thing on tv.com yes we can find everything you could find all of our past live shows you can find all our mini sets our regular episodes the director's cuts and as you noticed last sunday we're starting a series of shows where we're gonna go back into the archives and remaster because in the beginning, before we really cared about the audio quality, me and Chico's audio levels on some of the early episodes are absolutely terrible. So we are starting to fix the early episodes up to episode 20. We're not doing episode one because I believe, Mike, you already did that with episode one a while back. Yeah, I, I did a little bit of an update. and not, We're not talking about episode 100, but yeah, there is a new version or a newer version I uploaded Sometime, I think, last summer. Yeah, so we're not worried about episode one. So up to episodes two through 20 before I got a better headset. Thank you, Justin Rosero, by the way. We are going to go into the archives. We started with Mr. Smith, and coming this coming Sunday, we're going to revisit in the remastered version. Say it, Mike. No, I want you to say it. Auto Man and Manimal. Zippers! Zippers! Zippers? Oh, you weren't here for that. No, I wasn't here for that. Zippers. Oh, you gotta listen to it. I'll yes. listen to if it. If you've never listened to episode three, I think it's probably like one of the greatest moments in the history of the podcast. Yes. When we go through the episodes of Auto Man and we hit the episode... It, it's called zippers it is literally called zippers and, and, and that was my reaction it's like zippers that's like absolutely ridiculous but then we get into the logistics of everything because what zippers is is a male strip club and auto man goes undercover as a male stripper which really if you think about it he doesn't really have much there because you know he's like half cyborg and half person and and we really get into, or at least I get into, when he strips. Yeah, I mean, he's not wearing like underwear or anything. It's like this blue gel, the, the same color as like Aqua Fresh, not Aqua Fresh, but uh, what, what are that sparkly toothpaste from like thirty years? Crest, ago. crest for kids. Crest, yeah, crest. If you remember, like that color the Crest Man was in those ads. That's I do like remember the color, that. that. That's like the color, and, and actually. Uh, the, the texture of how Auto Man's girth, his his, his manhood. Well, uh, for lack of his, nose, more his, than his, his uh, cybernetic manhood. It, it was more than his manhood, but basically everything when he had his pants off was crest toothpaste, sparkly blue. Yeah, yeah. And now you have been spoiled on episode three, but it is an enjoyable episode three. And uh, Mike. 
still one day I'm going to own that picture of Simon McCorkendale and his Falcon. <laughs> and, and you're going to hang that in the museum. That may be actually something McLean Stevenson will actually hold in his hands. <laughs> big, yeah. He'll hold it in his hand, the picture of Simon McCork. Hey, I got a great, better idea. How about next to the giant statue of McLean Stevenson, we have a giant statue of Simon McCorkendale and his Falcon. A real Falcon or a statue Falcon? A statue Falcon hanging on his arm. I, I think a real Falcon would be like amazing, but I like your idea too. Yeah. yeah. It's like oh. remember that remember that giant monument of Superman with the eagle on his hand? Remember that, Chico? I yes. do. Yeah, that's it's gonna kind of be like that. A giant monument of Simon McQuarkendale with a falcon on his arm. It's going to be epic. Yeah. And also, you can go to Place to Be Nation Pop Experience and listen to our weekly Wednesday drafts, which by the way, right now you can check 151 and 152, which is the nerd and the amazing screw on head. And well, what more can we add about the nerd? I can't think of anything. Can you? It needed more tambourine. It needed more tambourine and more of Robert Joy dancing. Yep. And also, do not forget to hit up our social media, especially our YouTubes, where you can like, comment, and subscribe to our feed. And don't forget to ring the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, I'm going to find an air horn. Like a boat horn. That'll work. You know what? That works. It's, yeah. it's thematic, yes. Yes, it okay. is thematic. Okay. All right, so what do we have on tap next week? Next week, we're back into pilot month with uh, one entry that, that at, at least Greg and I can relate to because it has the tin dog in it. And not only that, but it has maybe one of the most bizarre WTF opening sequences of all time. It's very 80s. It's very early 80s and very what in the world is this? But you know what? We're going to take another detour from Pilot Month, but we're going to continue on the theme of the first episode. Considering pretty soon we're going to have the Academy Awards. And so for award season, we figured we're going to go back and cover a classic award show, but in true, it was a thing on TV fashion. It's not going to be your run-of-the-mill award show. And it's not going to be your run-of-the-mill award show moment either. No. And everybody knows the moment. Everybody knows the moment, but you don't know the entire event itself. You don't know the story behind the moment. You don't know the story behind the moment. And let's just say it's going to be Amazing. And you know what? I think it's going to be a long, long time till we get to that episode. But you know what? It's going to be epic. And you know what else is epic? What? It was a thing on TV Haiku Corner. Oh, no. Well, folks, are you ready for this? Let's do this. All right. Are you ready, Mike? Oh, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Titanic Hitsburg. Susan St. James reacted? Her response? Uh oh. George! <laughs> oh, God. And with that, we'll just leave you to think on that one until our next thing on TV. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend, everyone. Wow! It seems like uh, celebrities are, are everywhere, and, and thank God, our, uh, one of our stage managers, Biff Henderson, he does a little segment on... Here's Biff. Take a, take a bow, Biff. Come on, take a bow. There he is right there. He, Biff, Biff does this... Uh... Biff does a... Uh... A little segment of the show that is called the Biff Henderson Celebrity Interview, and you got one again for us tonight, right, Biff? Yes, I so do. Who is it do you talk to tonight? Uh, Le 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 Leonardo. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio. Yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay, so here it is. The Biff Henderson Celebrity Interview. Take a look. Leonardo DiCaprio, thank you for joining me tonight. Tell me, 
Do you have any funny stories from making of Titanic? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> How much? Five gallons? <laughs> Katie, bar the door. <laughs> what did you do? Blow it up real bad? <laughs> okay, okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> man, man, that crazy bastard is lucky to be alive. <laughs> Jeff Henderson, ladies and gentlemen, had a boy, bitch.